You're listening to Dirty Feet, a podcast from No More Radio. Vous écoutez le podcast Dirty Feet sur les ondes de No More Radio. Hosted by, animé par, Alison Burns, J.D. Papillon, et Stéphanie Morin-Robert. Stay tuned. We're going to move you. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Dirty Feet. Now, this is our 106th episode. And today we're extremely happy to receive with us uh, the choreographer Katie Ward, who will be presenting the piece Infinity Donut at the Tangent Space in Montreal. Uh, the performance will actually take place in the Studio de Quebec at the Monument National on November 27, November 27, 28th, 29th at 7.30 p.m. and November 30th at 4 p.m. Uh, so just remind everyone this is Tangent that's located in Montreal. And uh, as I mentioned, Kitty Ward, uh, few people might know her uh, from her collaboration as uh, one of the founding members, if I'm not mistaken, of the group, the choreographers. Uh, yes. She has choreographed many works herself, has performed also as a dancer, performer. Uh, so first of all, hi, Kitty. How are you doing today? Hi. Um, I'm doing really well today. Thanks. I'm thrilled to be on Dirty Feet. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned, well, I mentioned very briefly uh, a bit of your parkour you've done. Could you flesh out everything, well, not everything, but a bunch of what I've missed, please? Sure. Well, I moved to Montreal uh, just being feeling very excited about uh, living in what I think of as the dance mecca. Uh, And, um, yeah, so I've been here for quite a while. Uh, I arrived and I started working on solos for myself. And then at some point I met uh, Elizabeth Langley, who uh, we, en we ended up dancing together for Pierre-Paul Savoie. We were doing a piece called Strata, and she played... Um, character and I played the younger version of her. Anyway, so it during uh, while we were working together we toured a bunch and became close friends and she said why don't you go back to Concordia and study choreography because I hadn't and uh, so I did and I, I jumped into the third year of the program and I met some of my really important collaborators, uh, Ben Reed and Allie Blakely. And um, I learned so much in that third year of the Contemporary Dance Program at Concordia. And so I kind of felt like I was really given some skills that I didn't have before. And, um, yeah, and really inspired. And so uh, when I left Concordia, uh, Ben... Ali and I started working on dance pieces together, and we had a really great time. And we just, I think, yeah, for a while we were really obsessed with wolves. Uh, there was, like, there were, I think there was, like, five bands with wolf in the title, like, Wolf Parade, AIDS, Wolf. I can't remember the other names right now. Do you remember? Uh, out of the Montreal bands, no, but there was Wolf Mother for a while. Yeah, so, Wolf Mother, yeah, yeah. But there was another one in Montreal which had Wolf in the name, and I totally <laughs> forgot what it was. I know. Well, we were obsessed also with wolves and rock bands. <laughs> and so we made um, a piece together called Collapsible Uprisings, and that was not about wolves. That was just a kind of a physical study of falling and getting up for about 20 minutes. Um, and Which must not be taxing on the body. No, it's not. No, it's totally easy. <laughs> yeah, I think I, in that piece, I kind of learned... Uh, I, yeah, I, we started developing the vocabulary that we created, the three of us together, which was pushing the body to the very limit so that you... or to the edges of balance so that there was a, a shaky thing that would always happen and you'd see the body kind of buckle and collapse. So that just became like the basis for all the movement that we did. Um, yeah, and then, so the after collapsible uprisings, which I created 
under uh, while I was still at Concordia. Then we made a piece together called The Thrills, colon, Wilderness Retreat. And uh, so that was about a rock band. Um, and it was uh, like Ben and Allie were in a rock band, and I was also in the band, but they kicked me out of the band. And I had a fur jacket, and there was a wolf tableau kind of at the beginning, and uh, it was really aggressive movement, and uh, uh, it was really fun to do. And we created that over a year, just uh, twice a week in the studio uh, from 6 until 8 p.m., in case you wanted the details, <laughs> a little fruit break. Because <laughs> I that, didn't have any money to pay the dancers, so I just fed them fruit. <laughs> was that during your time at Concordia still, or was that afterwards? That was after. After work, okay. Yeah, so then I made a piece called Hawks and Doubts, and it was uh, Ben and Ali and Peter Trotzmer in that one. And so then I think that I kind of redid the thrills, but with another person. So then this time it was Ben and Ali and Peter, and Peter was sort of kicked out of the rock band. Really obsessed with this kind of... Uh, I think I was obsessed with power dynamics, mm -hmm. but just through movement. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I was trying to figure out how to uh, kind of choreograph um, a story but just in a loose way, just so that you could kind of see, oh, these people are together, but this person's not keeping up, um, not super literal, but at the same time, a kind of hints of um, relationships. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that one was fun, and that, um, that title came from a Neil Young album called Hawks and Doves. Um, I was I being really freaked out about like wondering if it was too political <laughs> or not. <laughs> when was that? Which year again? Uh, I forget. Maybe 2007. Yeah, so a good time Something to, like you know, make a political piece about hawks with Bush in the, in the United States and everything. It could be read as, as being political, I guess, with just a title like that. Yeah. Well, I think I was just interested in aggressive and non-aggressive behaviors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. around the same time I was dancing a lot for different people and I found myself often in duet with a dancer in Montreal called Dean Makarenko and um, yeah, I really, that was a, an exciting time for me as a dancer. I really, yeah, I think I just learned a lot about just being free and trusting my instinct on stage and just allowing any kind of impulse, uh, anything that's happening in the moment to affect what I was doing. Uh, and yeah, just trusting that any kind of way that I could be uh, the less, the less self-conscious would be resonant. Um, mm -hmm. So I did, yeah, I was doing a lot of dancing at the same time. and. I started a collective called Chien Perdu. Well, I don't know if it's a collective, but it was a, an improv group called Chien Perdu with Aaron Flynn and Dean Makarenko, and we did some performances. And then I, then uh, Peter, Thea, Audrey, and I started uh, the choreographers, and we were we just thought if you step back from the name the choreo from the name choreographer, it's just a funny word, mm -hmm. um, and you know, we get used to it in the dance community, but people who are not dancers have a hard time pronouncing it and think it's kind of funny and strange and esoteric. And um, I just thought it, I guess we all thought it would be really fun just to call ourselves the choreographers. Um, there was a bit of an element grandiose. with that, that company of branding. I, I would guess, especially with the, the sort of paper masks that you had in a lot of uh, yeah. the, the pictures, was that part of the, the reason to sort of uh, sort of make question that this sort of uh, marketplace quality of the choreographer with this branding? Like, why exactly the masks, I guess, is what I'm asking. Oh, well, we, we liked them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, an artist friend of ours... Um, 
made them available to us. So we were, Carlos Content uh, made them available to us. So that just seemed exciting in itself. And then, yeah, I guess uh, we thought that with, well, like the band Devo and other groups, um, you know, the, the members are anonymous. And so, yeah, just putting the blanket name, the choreographer sort of takes away each person's individual mm -hmm. identity. And then same with the masks, although you can very easily tell who is who since you know us and we're all very different mm -hmm. looking. Um, but it was fun. Yeah, it was fun to kind of take away a little bit of an identity and kind of create a, a mass uh, or just a, a group identity. And it's really fun to... Uh, yeah, cover your face and see what the body can express. Mm -hmm. And the, ma the masks that we used were gorgeous. And there were some, a lot of them were the same. They're, they're actually all masks of Carlos's face. But, uh, so they're all um, a stencil that you spray paint um, and you get the, the same outline. But then sometime, on some of the masks he did, he added a lot of decoration on so that it was sort of variations on a theme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was a great experience. Um, and after that, you went back to choreographing, also works uh, more on your own, or were you still collaborating with Ali and Ben at that time? Uh, yeah, I, I was still collaborating. I just, the work with the choreographers and my own work just was constantly, I was doing both at the mm -hmm. same time. Yeah, so I uh, was working on, I then I worked on a, a five-person choreography uh, with Ben Reed and Ali Blakely and Peter Trotzmer and Audrey Yuto and Patrick Lamotte. And Thea Patterson helped uh, as a dramaturge. And so that was super exciting. That piece is called Rock Steady. And that um, is still really inspired by rock music. Mm -hmm. um, actually, Rock Steady has many meanings. Um, I later found out it's a, do you know, it's a break isn't dance, it from, uh, New York. It, it was a break dance, but isn't it also a musical type yes, in it is. Jamaica or in Caribbean? Yes, it is. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, so someone to said the name one day. It's the precursor to ska. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and uh, I just thought, you know, it's an, an expression that we use to mean solid or reliable. And then I was like, oh, rock steady, it's such a great sounding name. Mm -hmm. um, and I was kind of starting to think more about consistencies and less about rock bands but it, <laughs> sorry i'm laughing it's no it's good it's a good sort of natural uh, organic turn through uh multi type of meaning yeah yeah so yeah and i think i was less interested in narrative all of a sudden um yeah and more into textures and finding let, allowing for openness so that all, you know, fair, the viewers can really decide for themselves, you know, that we each actually come to a show with a different mm -hmm. background and a different experience that day and different interests and um, we will all interpret what we see differently and uh, that's a really positive thing, like mm -hmm. just can, can we allow ourselves to not prescribe a meaning for our audiences, but just provide something clear so that people can make their own... Reading, understanding. Yeah. And uh, so in that piece that uh, I've been kind of structuring things in tableaus and putting them together, but that piece, there were many tableaus, and they were just like contrast and shift from one to the next really quickly and so that some people found that really annoying and other people found it really exciting so I think that was a positive thing uh, yeah but you mentioned that you moved away from the narrative aspect but did you stay as because uh, I mean uh, from what you mentioned it wasn't so much the narrative aspect that you were interested in but more the relationships aspect and did you did that stay present in in that work Good point. I was just thinking about that today. Um, yeah, I think that we re had really kind of created a, or found together as a group in our collaborations, um, 
a kind of natural body language and and yeah kind of supporting uh, relationships of different kinds and kind of a I think part of my feeling was if we spend a lot of time together you would feel the history of the relationships so part of the choreography is just, just taking time together mm -hmm. and so since we did that over uh, about 10 years <laughs> and slowly accumulate more and more collaborators I feel like um, that was really kind of an a t like in you couldn't it's not something that you can see and touch but it's something very tangible mm -hmm. yeah and I think that's still really important to me uh, kind of a, a type of connection mm -hmm. uh, between people is this something that you've ever wondered how you could create a simulacra of that type of connection with a group of people that have not had 10 years to grow into it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, sometimes I question that process, period. And then other times I... Um, well, what, so one of my techniques is that, or thing, ways of dealing with that is to just always, you know, have a group and then bring one person into the group. So there's mm -hmm. a kind of a group feeling, but there's a new element. So that slowly can kind of get created mm -hmm. over time. But I think that actually in my new work, Infinity Donut, I'm trying to create a feeling of togetherness uh, between the, everyone, all the participants in the room. So including the dancers and uh, the, the they're performers, interpreters, collaborators, um, but including them and the audience and the technicians and anyone else who's present. And I think it's possible. Uh, I think when you were, think about the very confusing topic of energy mm -hmm. and vibe <laughs> and the very hard to manage uh, energies mm -hmm. in the room, I think that you can actually be sensitive and create a chemistry, because I think it's a kind of chemistry that I'm talking about. I think you can be sensitive and create a chemistry between people quickly. Mm -hmm. Also, of course, it'll be different, but I think there, I think that you can, if there's a kind of a unselfconsciousness and a genuineness and a openness you can create a willingness that. basically to find that that connection with others yeah I think if you can lead mm -hmm. through you know if you're behaving in a, an open way I think you can lead other people to be that way and I think you can. it's something that you feel and so it's lovely to watch it but it's also really lovely to experience so I'm hope I'm actually that's my hope and dream for this upcoming show is that we can all feel together and feel like we've seen something but also experienced something and maybe we've noticed some change mm -hmm. of some kind in our experience. You mentioned earlier um, uh, the importance of power dynamics and hierarchy. In, in your previous work, especially ones that were around in the bands with the rock, uh, rock walls and everything. Mm -hmm. Is this something that you feel is a new direction for those questions of power dynamics and hierarchy? Because those are ever present in a relationship between choreographer, performers, collaborators, and audience. Is this something that, in, that uh, through Infinity Donut you feel that you'll revisit, but maybe in a less confrontational way, but in a and the more those power dynamics can uh, can be a bit more subdued, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think that I'm uncomfortable with hierarchy, and uh, so probably with some of those earlier pieces, I was trying to kind of experience it and recreate it to mm -hmm. deal with it. And uh, I think that Infinity Donut, in Infinity Donut, I'm trying to find a different way to like level. Mm -hmm. level the relationships um, definitely and so we'll see I mean but it, but that's it's how we worked in the studio I mean I feel in some ways like just the organizer 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, I, and also, I have, you know, kind of inserted my interests into the working space. But beyond that, uh, I feel like there's a everyone there's a space for everyone to really um, say what they think and and lead or suggest make suggestions and try things out and it's not a it's not a pure co- uh, collaboration because I in the end do make choices about um, what I feel I like mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, I think there's a much more kind of level way of working and uh, feels good to me. Do you feel that there is a place for an authorial voice uh, in dance? Because it's such a collaborative process by nature, uh, because you use people's bodies and use people's minds quite often, because movement gets so often uh, the creation of more. You know, the, the evolution of the movement in a piece comes from a lot of people quite often, especially in the Montreal scene. Do you feel that this idea of an author, quote-unquote, Uh, has any resemblance of reality in a scene such as ours in Montreal? Or do you feel that this is a bit of a fallacy that does not really apply for dance in a way or to movement performances? Um, well, I think there's many authors mm-hmm. in a work. And, uh, and that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, I think it's important to make sure that everyone is credited for the work that they do. Um, I think it really depends on the choreographer. Uh, some choreographers are, I think, very specific and rigorous. And it's kind of a, you know, there's a sort of a god-like hierarchy. <laughs> like, everyone is trying to recreate the image of the choreographer. So that's, I think that's still exists mm-hmm. definitely in Montreal and but there's just a range of ways of doing things then there's also um, people trying to jam on an idea and bring the way they do uh, the, their perspective their movement perspectives into uh, research mm-hmm. and I'm sure there's many kind of uh, Uh, ways of approaching that in between those two opposites and, and maybe other other ways altogether that I don't know about. But um, I think it's lovely that we have uh, this huge range of methods and styles mm-hmm. and relationships. And you mentioned um, when it comes to relationships that you will be creating with the audience and you mentioned that you're putting everyone sort of on the same level. How How are you doing this through the, the type of space that will be used for the performance? Because, uh, I mean, again, there is a, a hierarchical sort of presentation to the traditional performance space with the stands, uh, you know, with quite often a bit of a rake and the people in the front with the lights directed at them. Is this something that you decided, let's change the traditional space in here so that we can move towards that sort of... Um, anti-hierarchical uh, presentation? Is this something that you're looking to change in this piece through the physical space? I don't know if I thought about it as removing hierarchy, um, but I did, I thought of it, uh, yeah, so we have no risers, there mm-hmm. are no seats, and the, the audience will sit around in the space. Um, At Tangente, though, there is a mezzanine level. Mm-hmm. And so people with mobility issues uh, are welcome to sit on the mezzanine. So there will actually be two levels of viewing. <laughs> so kind of, you know, viewers up in the sky uh, and then people down. <laughs> um, but I think the reason why, uh, like God and the mortals, just kidding. <laughs> Um, Let's go deep in there. <laughs> yeah. No, the, I think... Um, okay. Uh, so, I was really excited by um, the possibility of uh, each viewer having their own 
distinct experience. So um, with, with the dancers, with the viewers and the dancers all mixed together on the floor, uh, everyone, you know, has a different spatial relationship to the action. Um, there's some, I don't want to give away too much, but the, you know, the audience comes in at a certain point and the movement happens around. So everyone has a really distinct and unique experience for part of the uh, performance. And uh, I was, I'm, I guess I'm kind of interested in how it's like, well, where is the location of the performance? Is it outside? Uh, is it something that you can see or is it something that you're thinking about? And so you're, is it is a performance in your mind, in your thoughts, um, because of what might be happening? You mentioned the, um, the in, in the creative process, as is described on your website, on the, the Tangent website, mm -hmm. there is something that I find super interesting here, um, which says, we celebrate all tastes, preferences, and ideas. And this, uh, coming from the perspective of a choreographer or... A performance facilitator, or something like that, you might call it in this case, because of the collaborative, collaborative um, aspect of it. Mm -hmm. How would you stay true to this idea of celebrating all tastes, preferences, ideas, but still making choices, making edits in the piece? Because this is what a piece is basically. It's a, it's a series of edits. How do you sort of juggle that? Because that that See, that's making my head go all like. Yeah, um. me too. Uh, yeah, that was completely overwhelming, and of course, it's impossible mm -hmm. to do. Um, uh, well, at some point, I decided the piece would be called Infinity Donut, and then I realized, well, so the word infinity is in there, so actually, we're treating infinity. At first, I hadn't realized it, so. Um, uh, so, the way, that, of course, so, as it, again, I'll just say, we have failed at that goal, which is uh, to celebrate all tastes, forms, preferences, but, it, um, uh, but we've tried to stay, create as many openings as possible. I thought, um, so, um, we've created various scores. So they're kind of like methods or techniques, modes of movement, modes of expression. So the piece moves from one kind of score to another and to another. And so they each have a openings and ways to um, allow for different forms, as many forms as um, the dancers can think of to emerge and so it's very stimulating to have an audience there because the dancers are visually stimulated by the audience and so this is part of the stimulus that triggers new forms mm -hmm. to come out so they're kind of it's sort of like we've created different algorithms um, a different kind of formulas to create movement and so we've jump from one to another. So the movement will probably be different each time. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, but the way, the kind of systems for de developing the movement and having it emerge are the same. Uh, and they're quite specific. And so that was really what took the two years of research is to figure out how to do that. And that, so half the piece is is made of, is scored, and then the other half is I don't know if it's half and half, but the other part is tightly choreographed. Mm -hmm. And so there's a slow transition from the scores to the more tightly choreographed. But I'm not sure if you would be able to tell mm -hmm. that it was choreographed. Um, so I mean, like you know, set. We know that there's a very specific movement that happens each time. In this uh, type of interaction with the public, or in, in this type of influence that the public can have, um, 
over over the performers or the people on stage. There is something that that has a possibility of creating a, a much more connective and much more you're in on the joke with us kind of aspect, I would guess, for, for the audience members. But at the same time, uh, counteracted by that, there is also the fact that it, it is such a close-knit group that is sort of uh, placed next to a group of strangers who don't necessarily have those connections with those people. Is this something that the, through, through uh, the work in progress, uh, you've presented in front of strangers, in front of other people to sort of see how it could go, how it wouldn't feel like one big inside joke for an hour? I mean, I hoped for it not to be an inside joke. Um, we try to react to what the how the audience is. I mean, so one of the scores is that um, any impulse, sound, or movement is uh, it's possible to kind of copy or uh, not necessarily copy, but react and respond to any of those things. So that we we do that at the beginning. So hopefully. We call that our um, the philosophical web, <laughs> and uh, we talk. The dancers talk to each other and ask questions, and also ask questions to the viewers. Just a few. Um, so in this way, we try to create a kind of a group feeling, um, which is a, a big challenge. Um, and you don't it's, say. it's not always possible, but uh, I mean, we're, we've. We practiced. We've, we're practicing with um, audience, and then we'll keep working on it. So that's, that's the work in progress part. Um, I do. Th I think also about a diagram called nested paradigms. <laughs> so it's a bit like a donut. There's like a. It's like or a nest. <laughs> so there's this circle. So that's like a one meaning, and then a circle around that circle, which creates another meaning on the interior meaning. And then you can just keep going with concentric circles leading outwards. Um, so each new reality or context or quality is in relationship to the others, but they all create their own mm -hmm. uh, charge. So, uh, yeah, for sure, having an audience be with the, the source of, of the research, they, they don't know the same things, but we're trying to transmit something, but we also are aware that they have their own reality that will affect us. I mean, it's it basically impossible. I, I like the impossibility of the task of trying to create form and connection and just you know it's a, an experiment we just see how far or what emerges each time it's, it's scary and mm -hmm. fun um, did you go see uh, Kieran Deneau's uh, Pleasure Dome maybe two years ago yes I did in, in the way the space was structured uh, there was this element of everyone sitting around in a circle and the performers being inside um, and I'm, I'm just going to give a, a little anecdote of my own experience with this. I spent way too much time looking at other people watching the piece than I did actually looking at the performers. I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't put a judgment on it. It's not that it's a bad thing or anything, but my eye was constantly attracted to other people and the way they would watch, the way they would enjoy the performance. Is this something that, um, I mean... Well, first of all, do, do you feel that you ever do that in something like this, in, a, in a, that type of performance? And if so, is this something that was part of the questioning in this process of how the audience members might actually become really interested in other audience members also? I mean, I think that I, I see that as a positive thing. Um, we never can know how audience members will mm -hmm. react. Um, but since... For me, this my piece is, or our piece is about relationship. I welcome people's, uh, you know, everyone has their own interest, mm -hmm. their own perspective, and 
um, if that was what some people noticed most. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I'm, I'm trying to create an event where there are things to notice and everyone will come away with a different um, meaning and what, what it was that they spent the time doing. So I, I kind of see the audience as a part of the performance and, and a scenography and uh, I think it also really depends like on the action and the energy and the pacing and phrasing of, of what you're doing and, and the setup. I, if I think about Karine's choreography, um, there was a, a lot of there was spaciousness and there was it was a big space and there was things took lots of time to unfold. I bet she was I bet she intended or was she, I'm sure she was aware of that possibility and inclusive of it, and mm -hmm. I think I am also. <laughs> That's funny, because a lot of what you've talked about, um, such as the, the, the moving away from this aspect of communication and like showing a dance piece is a form of communication, of having the meaning, the one meaning be understood, uh, of accepting that people's gaze might wander, this is something that feels really, really tough on the ego, uh, I find. This is something that, I mean, just myself through my works, this is not something I feel that I have the maturity or the, the strength of conviction, maybe, I don't know, to accept. This is something that would worry me a lot. Is this something that you feel you've grappled with or that you've come to terms with throughout your years as a choreographer? Is this something that actually motivates you to create works now? The fact that, that, that you can sort of move away from those mm -hmm. those egocentric or not so much narcissistic, but just like, you know, I am the choreographer. Mm -hmm. I want people to, you know, moving away from those wants mm -hmm. and needs and more towards those, this is what I bring and this is, you know, please enjoy the big buffet, basically. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's actually challenging to create a, a rich environment. Mm -hmm. And so uh, and I have spent a lot of time thinking about form and choreography, me, choreography and it's a hard word to say. And, uh, <laughs> it's such a funny word, though. I know. <laughs> um, and spacing and pacing and form and rhythm and all of those things and um, that stuff is important to me and uh, um, but I also I guess when I was first thinking about uh, this piece I was going like wow well, what's what else is out there like what's the what's something I don't understand or what is a different experience and uh, so I I, yeah, I understand what you're saying, and I think probably at a different time I would have been really scared. And I was actually extremely scared for most of this process, um, but ex very excited also, because I, I feel like most of these things I didn't know how to do at all. Um, but that's the fun challenge uh, to being a creative person, I mm -hmm. think, is to... Um, to just see, uh, well, what, where are you interested in going? And you mentioned fear, that, but also the fun of it. And in uh, one, one of the interesting things also you mentioned in your uh, in the creative process description on the Tangent website is that the group laughed a lot. And this is this is not something we read often. I mean, sometimes, but like th that idea of laughter, that idea which of course suits a process of, such as this based on connectivity very well. But this idea of laughing, we still don't hear it. Why was it important for you for this to be written there for audience members to know that your stance as a choreographer for this piece was that laughter was a big part of it? Well, I mean, it's a... I, well, I, I was talking about the creative process. Um, Laughter is an important part of the process. Uh, I also, yeah, it's, we can all get really serious. I, 
sometimes I was too serious. Uh, uh, I've read a lot of literature that talks about laughter. I mean, you hear laughter is the best medicine, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's super cheesy, but it's true. Um, uh, but, you know, laughter can actually get your creative brain waves flowing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it relaxes people and it makes, I think it kind of creates a situation for people to feel like they're more themselves. Mm-hmm. It also relaxes the diaphragm. <laughs> so for dancers is great. Exactly. It helps release the back. Um, yeah, maybe it was important for me to explain that we're serious and also not serious. Um, it's also part of the vocabulary of the piece. So I was describing us <laughs> developing vocabulary. A little nugget of knowledge about what yeah. people were, were actually seeing. Yeah, but I've, I tried, um, I learned about um, a few techniques for, you know, being more creative. Um, and so one of them was, uh, actually, some of the, both, two of them are in the work um, as things that hopefully the audience will experience. But uh, also we did, uh, like, self-help questions every day or for part of the process where we would just go in a circle and talk about how we were doing. And, uh, yeah, I feel like it was important just to kind of be relaxed and be present with each other. And when we were that way, then uh, we were very productive and creative in short amounts of time. So I think the laughter is part of that. Mm -hmm. Is there anything left that should be said about the piece? I really acknowledge all of my collaborators, like throughout my whole life as being really important to uh, influencing me and bringing me to where I am today. And uh, yeah, I just feel so grateful for all of the connections I've had with people. All right, so this is it for this week's episode of Dirty Feet. Just to remind everyone, uh, we were talking to the choreographer Katie Ward, who will be presenting the piece Infinity Donut with her many collaborators at Tangent the, uh, during the, the week of the November 27th, 28th, 29th at 7.30 p.m. and on November 30th at 4 p.m. at the studio au Québec of the Monde National with Tangent. Uh, so thank you so much, for, uh, Katie, for coming today with us. Thank you. Dirty Feet was previously recorded at the Montreal Improv Theatre and is currently recorded out of Mainline Theatre. Thanks, dudes. Dirty Feet est produit et animé par Produced and hosted by Alison Burns J.D. Papillon et Stéphanie Moret-Robert You can find out more about our show at nomoreradio.com Follow us on Twitter at Dirty Dirty Feet and find us on Facebook at Dirty Feet Podcast Vous pouvez écouter tous nos épisodes sur notre site web ou Vous pouvez vous abonner également sur iTunes à notre podcast. Listen to past episodes on website or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. While you're there, be sure to give us a rating and or leave a comment to help us spread the word. Tune in next week for a whole new show.